Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromycel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromycel technology. Do your patients know what presbyopia is? There are people who are afraid of the press. Have you talked to your patients about multifocal contact lenses? I've heard the bifocal, but not right, multifocal. Not multifocal. Do you need help with your multifocal strategy? Learn more at the conclusion of this episode. With more screen usage and indoor time, myopia, also known as nearsightedness, is increasing and getting worse in children. Now, certified eye doctors can prescribe my sight one day, the first and only FDA-approved soft contact lens to slow myopia progression in age-appropriate children. Visit coopervision.com to find a Brilliant Futures certified eye doctor near you. Hello and welcome to the Open Your Eyes podcast. I'm Dr. Kerry Gill, the host of the documentary, Open Your Eyes. If you're new here and you like our interviews, press like, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to get notifications of great new interviews. Also, please leave comments. Great news. You can now watch our full-length documentary, Open Your Eyes, on Amazon Prime, Apple TV, iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube movies and shows. Optimal omega-3 red blood cell levels have been shown to help many body systems. Omega-3s decrease the risk of cardiovascular disease, joint pain, and can help memory and improve dry eyes. Most people are not aware that there is an easy at-home test that can measure your omega-3 levels. Today's guest, Dr. Bill Harris, PhD, co-inventor of the Omega-3 Index. This groundbreaking test has been used in over 200 clinical studies. Dr. Harris has more than 300 publications relating to fatty acids. Dr. Harris is a professor at the Sanford School of Medicine, University of South Dakota. He is currently conducting research on fatty acids and health. Dr. Harris, thank you for joining me today. Hey, great to be here. You know, Dr. Harris, other than cardiologists, eye doctors probably prescribe more uh, omega-3s than any other profession. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that, but I wish it wasn't true. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, more doctors doing it too. <laughs> you know, it gets, con it gets confusing, uh, you know, with, with fatty acids. You know, people, you know, between omega-3s, omega-6, omega-9s. So if we could start off there where you could kind of help, you know, with some of the nomenclature. So, so let's start off with what are, what are fatty acids? What are omega-3s? Let's start with omega-3s first. Okay. Well, omega-3s are, well, I guess I probably should start with a fatty acid because that is uh, basically uh, the whole world we're living in. Uh, fatty acids are simply carbon chains, a, a single chain of carbon atoms. That's a fatty acid, uh, and it has a acid group, which is why we call it a fatty acid, on one, one end, chemically speaking, and uh, on the other end of the molecule is uh, just the end of the molecule. And, and the, these are what, the, the best mind picture of a fatty acid basically is to think about a bottle of vegetable oil in the grocery store, or a, a butter, or Crisco. Those things are made 95% of fatty acids. Uh, they're in a what's called a triglyceride form. Uh, means three fatty acids hooked together on one molecule. But that's uh, fundamentally they're fatty acids, and fatty acids are fats. If uh, fats are f fats are solid at room temperature, oils are liquid at room temperature, but they're all fats together. Um, the omega threes. Uh, you, you alluded to three different omega classes, there's, and there's more omegas than that, but the, the important ones are really the omega-3 and the omega-6, because those are the two families of fatty acids that we call essential, meaning we can't make them in our bodies. We can pretty much make all the other types of omega, omega fatty acids, um, but the omega-3s and omega-6s are unique in that we have to have them in our diet. Uh, so the omega threes and sixes, they get the name isn't just pulled out of blue blue sky. It means something. 
Um, if you think about this long chain of carbon atoms that I call a fatty acid, and one end is a, the acid group, uh, and we, in chemistry, we call that uh, the, the first carbon. We call that the alpha carbon. That's the beginning. And then the, at the very end of the molecule is the omega carbon, alpha and omega, in the Greek alphabet, beginning and end. Uh, sometimes we call that last carbon the nth carbon, the last carbon. Uh, so we'll get omega minus 3 means that the first double bond in the molecule, so typically most of the bonds between the carbon atoms are single bonds in chemistry. Sometimes we have double bonds, and that changes the structure. The first double bond in every omega-3 fatty acids is the third position from the omega carbon, so the last carbon. So it's an omega minus 3 position. Same for omega-6. The first one is six positions in. And that's sort of the last name, in a sense, if you think about families. The, the last name of the family is that little carbon structure. Um, and so all the omega-3s have the, that situation, where the first double bond's at the last uh, three, three positions in. And then there's about four or five different members of the omega-3 family. Uh, the ones we're most interested in are EPA and DHA, which are the two omega-3s that are in fish oils that come from the ocean, fundamentally. Uh, there's one other omega-3 that's called alpha-linolenic acid, ALA, and that is uh, a shorter chain to come more of a second cousin in a way. Um, to, and that's what you hear about in flaxseed oil or, or perilla seed oil, chia seeds. They have that one. But that particular omega-3 fatty acid, ALA, is... Uh, doesn't really impact the omega-3, the good omega-3s in the body very much at all. So we really focus on EPA and DHA, the marine ones. So that's the omega-3 story. So with the ALA, how much of it actually gets converted to, to DHA or EPA? Um, rule of thumb, less than, less than 5%, maybe in some studies less than 1%. And is there any benefit to eating uh, flax, seed, flax seeds or hemp seeds when it comes for the for ALA for energy, or does it does it help us in any way? Well, they, I mean they're they're fine. Uh, those products um, are are fine. Uh, traditionally, things like uh, uh, flax seed might be used for uh, constipation as as uh, uh, fiber in a sense in the diet to improve uh, GI function. Or, you know, uh, so you don't get constipated, uh, that kind of thing keeps things moving. Um, but from the omega-3 side, uh, they don't really add much from an omega-3 benefit. Uh, but they're, they're, they're fine foods, fine products for other reasons, but not so much for the omega-3. One time it was felt that flaxseed oil, taking a lot of flaxseed oil, could increase the risk of prostate cancer. Is that something that's still thought of, or is it something that you even thought about in a while? Well, yeah, I haven't seen that. I mean, there, yeah, there, there was a time when there were some studies that suggested that. Um, I think that has been put away. The, the, the average intake of, of alpha linolenic ALA, the plant omega-3, in America is like, like a one and a half grams a day, something like that. So it's, you know, a quarter of a teaspoon amount of... of uh, of uh, ALA, fatty acid, and that's fine. That serves our, our needs perfectly well. Uh, but again, it doesn't give us the EPA and DHA, which are, so the ALA is, just to be simple, uh, 18 carbons long, and it has three of these double bonds. EPA and DHA are 20 and 22 carbons long, so they're considerably longer molecules, and they have four and five, five, five and six double bonds. So they are very chemically very different structures, more complex structures, and it's just hard to go from that more simple ALA structure to the EPA and DHA. At one time, patients would think they would take a spoonful of flaxseed oil, and they thought they were getting the same benefit if they were taking a spoonful of DHA, EPA, or uh, fish oil. That's right. That's called creative marketing. It's called deceptive marketing, in my view, because the people that are selling Flaxseed oil will say, full of omega-3, which is literally true. It's a little deceptive because people don't realize that the, the, the best omega-3s are the EPA and DHA, which there's none of that in, in flaxseed oil. 
So let's move on to DHA. Uh, I don't know what you feel is more important. Some places say DHA is more important. Other places say EPA is more important, but we know they're both important. So tell me about DHA and what it does for us. Yeah, DHA, so that's the, the, the longer, the bigger uh, of the two uh, marine omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA. Uh, DHA is unique in that it is a major component of the brain and of the uh, retina, of the, the eye. Uh, it's, the body has, is designed to put the, this particular fatty acid in uh, places where there's a lot of electrical activity. And that's certainly true in the brain, and it's certainly true in the eye. Actually, it's the, the, one of the other rich sources is uh, in, <clears throat> in the testes. In the, that gland in the, in the male is very rich in DHA. There's a lot of fluidity needed uh, for spermatozoa to move. Uh, but, so DHA has its own characteristics. Um, it's the, of the EPA and DHA, if you just look at any tissue in the body, but besides just the brain and the eye, uh, if you look at muscle or liver or, or red blood cells, you'll see that DHA is by far the predominant omega-3 fatty acid in the membrane, and the body is, is built that way to, to put it there. So like in red blood cells, for example, which is a t tissue we use a lot, about 85% of the EPA plus DHA, 85% of that metric is DHA, and about 15% is EPA. Um, I, I don't know that that necessarily means importance, uh, you can have something present in a very small amount and have it be very important. Uh, so I, I can't put a, a scale on that, but as you said, uh, these two fatty acids always come together in nature, in the foods we eat, and if we eat fish. Um, I'm, I'm a primary fan of people getting both EPA and DHA and not trying to just pick one over the other. Um, because I don't think we really know for sure one is any better than the other for any given disease condition. In fatty fish, what's typically the ratio of EPA to DHA when we're eating the fatty fish? Um, in, in salmon, it's going to be um, a, l a little more EPA than DHA. Um, and some of the, uh, and, and that same is true in most fish oil supplements. And those fish oil supplements, the standard ones, the, the basic garden variety fish oil pills are coming from anchovies uh, off of the coast of Peru and they're about uh, two parts EPA to one part DHA. Uh, but their tuna, for example, is much richer in DHA uh, than EPA. So it, it varies by fish and, and you know, fish don't, fish don't make omega-3s just like we don't make omega-3s. They have to eat them and they eat it. So the omega-3s come from their diet the, the original source of uh, omega-3 fatty acids in the ocean is kind of single-celled microorganisms, plankton, uh, microalgae, uh, which are essentially plants and will convert sunlight energy into making the omega-3s. And then you know, those omega-3s, once made, follow their way up the food chain into the fish and eventually into us. And I think there's been a number of studies that are done on vegetarians to show that their omega-3 index, which we're going to get into in a minute, is very low in vegetarians. And for the and you know because they won't eat, they don't eat fish, but they can take algae supplements. Uh, is that correct? And in increase their omega-3 index right. in, in the red blood cells. Right, right, and it's a good point because uh, obviously, like I said, the, the original source in nature of these omega-3s is a, a specific, a few specific species of microalgae, single-celled algae, single-celled plants is really what they are. And uh, people have been uh, cultivating these and growing them in big vats in, in Iowa, you know, where, where you could just cr create a lot of these things and they harvest the omega-3s and they use that to plant derived EPA and DHA. And that's, uh, we'll call that an algal oil for coming from algae. Uh, not from any algae, but from very specific algae, it's not seaweed. Um, and that is a very good source of omega. It's kind of an expensive source because it's, it's a lot of work to get it. Um, but it's a very good vegan source of um, omega-3s that's available in capsule form, EPA and DHA. One thing that gets very confusing is that they tell pregnant women not to eat fish because of the 
content of mercury and and uh maybe other toxins that may be in the fish but we know that for intelligence for the baby it's very important that they have omega-3s especially dha and how could a pregnant person uh a pregnant woman uh you know overcome that that hurdle it's yeah i mean it's, there's a lot of misinformation there too if, uh, honestly uh the proscription of the, or the uh, advice to not eat fish is is just totally incorrect it it's the, the recommendation is don't eat four one of four species of fish shark tile fish king mackerel and uh um, swordfish okay so there's four fish that are particularly rich in mercury while you're pregnant don't eat them but that leaves like a thousand other kinds of fish you can eat and that gets completely lost salmon is a, a great source of omega-3 uh, sardines and they have virtually no mercury in them so they should not be avoided by pregnant women and the other point is that when we've actually looked at we've done studies of the relationship between fish intake during pregnancy in populations and pregnancy outcomes and the and the development of the children it's very very clear that the higher the fish intake the more uh, the, the better the intelligence or the cognitive function of the baby is regardless of the mercury intake it's ir ir the mercury level is irrelevant to that in fact in some studies where they've kind of just looked at mercury levels and outcomes in in certain places around the world, the higher the mercury level in the kid because of eating fish, the more, the more, the better their cognitive outcome. Because the mercury, mercury is a marker for eating fish because that's why, you know, but the mercury is not hurting them. Uh, mercury has gotten such a bad rap um, in this area. But to your point, if you want to not eat fish while you're pregnant, take omega-3 supplements. So with an infant, if you want to give an uh, infant omega-3s, and there's, a, there's plenty of liquid omega-3s, yeah. uh, how much, what do you think a good dose, I, I don't think there really, there's any standard dose, but if it was your grandchild, someone who knows more about omega-3s than anybody else in the world, how much are you going to give, and are you going to, obviously you have to give them liquid, how much would you give them? Well, if we just back up a minute, the best way to do it is to have mom take it and the mom to breastfeed the baby. Okay. That, so I now mean, breastfeeding yeah. is over. Now breastfeeding okay, We're past is over. breastfeeding. We're now one year old or something like that. We're now in the diet. Um, I think if you can give, gee, uh, two, three, four hundred milligrams a day of EPA plus DHA, uh, that's going to like quadruple their normal intake. Uh, and that's... A, very healthy, reasonable intake. Uh, I'm not sure you need to get up, you know, into a gram a day, uh, but but as as you say, there really isn't any standard dose at this point that anybody knows about. It, it's pretty tough to to study, do randomized studies on kids on brain development. Uh, it's a, a very touchy time of life, and you you don't want to mess with too much. So we don't know a lot there. So a question I have also is for an adult like myself, I'm taking omega-3s. Is it better to take the oil or is it better to take capsules if it's, uh, say it's the same omega-3 because the oil, is it broken down by digestion sooner and you're not getting the benefit or would you say it doesn't really matter? Um, number one, taking it's the important thing. And if you can't stand the oil, take the capsule, that's better. But um, presuming your, your question is, if you have an equal opportunity to take it as a liquid versus a capsule, take it a liquid. Take a liquid. You think liquid yeah. is better? Yeah, it digests. Uh, it certainly gets emulsified in the stomach and the small intestine faster. You don't have to actually digest the, the gelatin capsule. Um, so that, that's the, the better way to do it. And when we look at EPA, uh, EPA, uh, they say that EPA doesn't get into the brain. Uh, but but it does, uh, it does uh, decrease arachidonic acid. So it decreases inflammation by the brain through decreasing uh, arachidonic acid. Is that correct? By blocking uh, uh, delta-5 uh, uh, desaturase. Well, it, it, uh, yeah, so does taking EPA lower brain arachidonic acid? That's kind of the That's question. a question. And I don't 
think that any, I mean, I don't think anybody's looked at that question. It's, it's one thing to talk about the brain, meaning the actual meat of the brain, the, the flesh, the, the tissue. Yeah, and that's true. There's very little EPA in that tissue. Almost all the omega-3 is DHA. Uh, and th that's obviously by design. There's some reason for that. Uh, that does not mean that EPA is not helpful for cognitive, for, for brain-related outcomes. In fact, in, in, in the area of depression, in depression, they've, they've seen that the mo most effective products for reducing the symptoms of depression are EPA-rich supplements. Nobody predicted that. Everybody ex expected it would be DHA, but and it could be somewhat by the mechanism you're talking about, um, either that EPA uh, produces anti-inflammatory mediators that circulate, of course, through the microcirculation of the brain. I mean, there's EPA in the brain in the sense that it's in the blood that's in the brain, uh, and it, it doesn't have to actually cross the blood-brain barrier. And it may, it, certainly in the liver, it will reduce the production of arachidonate, but we're not talking about much. You know, arachidonate normally is 12% and over 15% on a red cell, it might go down to 13%. You know, it might drop a little bit. Um, what actually happens inside the brain cells uh, when you feed EPA, nobody really knows. And if we're talking about ADHD, mm -hmm. uh, there's been some suggestions, some studies that show that omega-3s do help uh, ADHD. Uh, I think more on the EPA side. Yeah, if that's correct. Um, I don't, I can't say that I know. Um, I have to look back at the studies myself. Um, I, typically, people are giving EPA plus DHA if they're doing a randomized study with on ADHD or uh, any um, cognitive outcome. And usually it's both EPA and DHA are in those products. So it, it's, um, an un, it would be an unusual study to just give EPA. Uh, for an, AD, an ADHD study, but that, I'm not saying they're not out there. And is, is there a risk of giving too much omega-3s because um, uh, the DHA part of it can uh, can decrease uh, decrease GLA, which could I know this is kind of getting into the weeds, but but I just want to get this out of, out of the way at the, at the beginning. The, that it could decrease uh, GLA, which is some of the good pro-inflammatory, uh, 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 anti-inflammatory markers that we may need. And would you have to give back GLA? If you're gonna take a lot of omega-3, should you also take GLA is really the question. Um, you're asking some good questions here, Kelly. Uh, Kelly, I'm not sure that, I don't think we really know the answer to that question. Of course, GLA is an omega-6 fatty acids, right. which we haven't really gotten into too much, a precursor for arachidonic acid. Um, and so, yes, if you th the more omega-3 you take, the less uh, you, you kind of block the production of the long chain omega-6 fatty acids like arachidonate through a GLA. Uh, you know, I, I would not be surprised if it would be beneficial to take long chain, if you're taking fish oils, to also take GLA. Um, but I can't say I've ever seen a study, uh, nor have I looked extensively. But that's not something that you know, that's something that you think about. Like if you're going to take uh, four grams of omega threes, I'm going to you're going to say to your your son or your daughter, I want you to take uh, GLA as well. I, I wouldn't say that, uh, but I'm. It's, it's not because I know that not to be true. It's just that it's something I haven't examined carefully to know. I. And I probably wouldn't be telling my son or daughter to take four grams of EPA and DHA. Uh, that's that's more, way more than is physiologically necessary. Uh, I, we think once you're up to maybe one and a half or two grams, you're probably in the in the sweet spot for long term. That's a that's kind of the Japanese intake. Uh, that's a population we like to look at as healthy um, uh, in, in in several ways. Uh, longevity. Oh. So about two grams, you would say, is a good preventative dose. Yeah, to the yeah, day. absolutely. One and a half to two grams, you'd say, yeah. is a good preventative dose. Right, right. Going up to four, five, six, eight, ten. I mean, you, you can do it. Uh, is it really providing any additional benefit? I don't think so. Do your patients know what presbyopia is? 
There are people who are afraid of the press. Have you talked to your patients about multifocal contact lenses? I've heard the bifocal, but not right, multifocal. Not multifocal. Do you need help with your multifocal strategy? Learn more at the conclusion of this episode. MacU Health, your science born and tested solutions for visual performance, macular degeneration, and dry eye syndrome. New products coming soon. Embrace the science. Do you think if you're taking, there's a magic number that if you take where you, you have to worry about blood thinning, like aspirin? Yeah, right. That's that's a very good and common question. Uh, and the whole idea that omega-3s thin the blood to the point of uh, causing you to, to hemorrhage uh, came from studies in the in Eskimos in the 1970s in Greenland. Uh, but, but that's all been uh, really shown not to be the case, that uh, many, many studies have now shown that to adding omega-3 to your diet may thin your blood a little bit, but maybe it's bringing it to a healthy level of thinness. It's actually too thick for most Americans as normal, and the omega-3s make it more optimal, which is a little bit thinner, but it doesn't mean there's any risk for what, what they call clinically significant bleeding. I mean, you might, the blood might attack, last a little bit longer when you're shaving if you cut yourself, but that's probably a good thing. It, it's a marker of health, not a marker of concern. So even if you're on warfarin or taking aspirin, other uh, uh, blood thinners, the omega-3s on top of that don't increase risk for bleeding. And what, so you talked about a uh, certain type of fish that have the omega-3s, and you mentioned salmon. What are the ones that you think are safe as far as mercury levels that we could take that we should uh, eat on a regular basis? Kind of, kind of an acronym that's developed called SMASH fish, S-M-A-S-H. Salmon, mackerel, uh, S-M-A-A. Anchovies? Anchovies, thank you. Whoever eats anchovies other than on a seafood <laughs> salad, I don't know. Uh, and then herring? Back, back to herring? sardines and herrings. Herring, okay, good. Yeah, that's, that's the group. So those are, you know, very, those are oily fish, we call them. Uh, and those are the ones that have the most omega-3 per serving because they have a lot of oil per serving, have a lot of fat. Um, and most, there's a, quite a few fish that have very little fat. They're very low fat fish, white fish. Um, you know, I think tilapia is kind of a great example. Uh, cod, there's almost no fat in the flesh. They store their fat like cod, very familiar, cod liver oil. Because the cod is a species that doesn't store fat in the flesh, it stores it in the liver. Um, and so the flesh is very low in fat. So if it's low in fat, it's gonna be low in fatty acids and it's gonna be low in omega-3 yeah, because there's just not much fat there in the first place. So let's talk about omega-6 now. If you could explain omega-6, it's also essential. Uh, we have to eat it, but maybe too much is not good, and a lot of it has to do with processed oils. So if you could tell us the benefits, the good, the bad, and ugly about omega-6. Omega-6 is, again, uh, the first, it's a whole series of, of fatty acids. The, the classic example is things like corn oil, soybean oil, uh, the seed oils, where the richest sources of the omega-6 fatty acids in our diet. Uh, we can't make omega-6 fatty acids. We have to have them. Um, and they do play a, a multitude of, of roles, good and bad. Uh, I think they've gotten an unnecessarily bad reputation, honestly, um, to the point where people want to avoid them. And I think that's probably a mistake um, because the omega there is a balance, EPA and DHA versus the omega-6s. There, there is probably some optimal balance. Um, but I think both EPA and DHA and the omega-6, the, the, the name of the fatty acid that we eat is called linoleic acid. It's, it's very much a, a partner to alpha-linolenic acid that, that sound a lot alike. The ALA is an omega-3, the linoleic acid is an omega-6, but they're both 18 carbons long, um, and that's the one that we eat a, a lot of, and I think pr to our benefit, frankly, uh, we've done a couple of studies published recently where we've looked at blood levels of the omega-6, linoleic acid, the one that's supposed to be so bad for us. We looked at blood levels in uh, tens of thousands of people, uh, and we've then followed those people over several years to see who develops heart disease and to see who develops diabetes. 
the idea, be, idea being if, if the omega-6s are bad, high blood levels of them coming, coming from high intakes, of course, because you can't make it. The only place to get it is eating it. So a high blood level should be associated with an increased risk for inflammatory-based diseases like heart disease, like diabetes. But the, the opposite is true. What we found and published is that the, high, the people who had the highest omega-6 levels in the blood had the lowest ultimate risk of developing heart disease or diabetes. And so I think with data like that, it's hard to make the case that you should reduce your intake of omega-6 fatty acids because that's just going to, if these, if these observations are true, it's just going to increase your risk for heart disease and diabetes. Uh, so I don't encourage people to lower their omega-6. Uh, the problem is we haven't got enough EPA and DHA. That's where we need to laser focus. That's the problem in America. It's not an omega-6 problem. The problem is the lack of EPA and DHA. And what do you feel is the best place to get omega-6? What kind of foods? Hmm. Um, anything that, well, salad oils. I mean, it's a kind of a common thing because that's... Uh, uh, that's where you get the oils per se. Uh, people will use canola and olive oil, which have very little omega-6 actually. Uh, <clears throat> and I, those are fine oils, but that's not a good place to get omega-6. I, th I think you should, people should not make an effort to avoid it. They're really in quite a few foods. Uh, actually, a lot of processed foods have some soybean oil. Um, that's the principle. In, in America, like 70% of our omega-6 comes from uh, soybean oil, and it's mixed into a lots of different kinds of foods. Um, and I, I just, I just think we need to not make it such a black hat, in a black hat, white hat story. Uh, the omega sixes are are good. Should, it's not something to be avoided. Not something to be intentionally not eaten. But we could get them from good sources like cashews. You know, uh, oh, well, ham, nuts, you know, right. almonds. You know, some some good nuts, and yeah, we can yeah, get them yeah. from good rather than processed foods we could get them from good things rather than processed sunflowers and sunflower oils or soybean oil so we can get it from good food for a while now and i know this is controversial is the omega-3 the omega-6 ratio uh i don't know if you want to comment on that i know that's been some somewhat controversial you know we thought for a while we want you know in the you know now you know we want a ratio of like maybe four to one of omega six to omega threes, but we're like twenty to fifty to one, which causes more inflammation. And how do you feel about that? Well, I mean, about let, that now? let's start with you know what is what is the real omega six omega three ratio in the American diet? If we just look at the at the data from the uh, intake surveys, it's it's ten to one. There's ten omega sixes, so. People, I hear, I hear what, you, what you just said, Gary. You know, 20, 30, 40, 50. Well, okay, maybe you can find one person that's got that kind of a complete imbalance, but the average is 10. My brother. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, I, anyway, let's just talk about the truth. The truth is the average is about 10 to 1. Okay. I still don't like the ratio. I don't like ratio thinking because of some things I've mentioned. Number one, the omega-6s are good for us, not bad, and that ratio implies kind of a, there's a black hat, white hat, good guy, bad guy thing going on. Right. Uh, and, and that's not necessarily true. Number two, when we use, scientifically it's imprecise to say omega-6 and omega-3 because we're not defining which fatty acids you're talking about in the omega-6 class or which fatty acids you talk about in the omega-3 class because the omega-3s in your ratio could be all ALA and no EPA DHA, and that's not good. Or it could be all EPA and DHA and no ALA, and that's, that's good. The omega-6s, we've, we've seen that some omega-6s are associated with, ben with benefits, some are associated with, uh, with um, not so much benefit, increased risk. But there's seven or eight omega-6 fatty acids. So which ones are you going to pick? You can pull, if you pull them all together, you're saying, well, they all do the same thing. Well, they don't. So that's not true. So the, the imprecision of just saying omega-6, omega-3 is wrong. The third point is you can have a good or a bad ratio if you have high levels of both omega-6 and omega-3. You can have the same ratio. If you, have, you can have almost deficient levels of omega-6 and omega-3 and have exactly the same ratio 
as you've got. So that's another problem with it. Um, so I just don't like it. I like the, 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 kind of that's why we came up with the omega-3 index, which we'll talk about later, which is ignores the omega-6. It's all about EPA and DHA, and that's what we need to focus on. We need to get our patients to focus on improving their EPA and DHA levels. Don't get caught up in the weeds of the omega-6, omega-3, and and worry about what the Paleolithic diet was or what ancestors 50 million years ago were eating. We don't know that stuff. And it's, anyway, I, so, I, get, I get hot about that one, Kerry. I, well, that's why I wanted to ask you, because I know it's a hot topic and I want to put it to rest. And I, omega-6 is, is essential. We need to have it. It improves immune health. It regulates genes. So for oh, our immune like system... That. So for our immune system gives us energy, we have to have omega-6. So people have to realize that that's important. And there's a lot of good omega-6, the GLAs, the primrose oil, the borage yeah. oils. Yeah, there you go. Right. And, and there's, there's good stuff. So let's move to omega-9, the last one, before we, we, go, we go deep into some of the omega-3 stuff. But I want to get the omega-9s, which isn't essential, right? That's correct. Omega-9 fatty acids simply have the first double bond in the ninth position, counting from the omega carbon. And the far and away, the most common one is an oil called oleic acid. We all remember our age, we remember oleo. And that's where the name oleo came from, oleic acid, which is a very, the, the far and away the principle. It's an 18 carbon, single double bond. So the, omega, the omega nines are principally one double bond, not two, not three, not five. And it's in the double bonds in that position. So there, I see no point in going out of anybody's way, or you're going out of your way to eat omega-9 because we can make it. We can make it from simple sugars. We can make it from breakdown of protein. Uh, we get as much of the omega-9 as we need just by our own bodies making it. So it's not an essential fatty acid, so it's not a dietary requirement. So I don't focus on omega-9s really at all. And, you know, they sell omega-3, omega-6, and omega-9 oil. I know. Is that something that you would usually say to most people to avoid and just stick with omega threes? You got it. That's and that's that's that's, a, that's, what my, that's my approach with my patients. Yeah, yeah. That's that's just a, a marketing gimmick because people have the idea there's something magic about omegas. It's not nothing magic about it. It's, I mean, you know, of course, the you know the omega nines is olive oil, avocado oil, and it helps with insulin sensitivity, decreases inflammation. But we're eating that. So we're eating. We're eating that. So we we need the omega threes. Okay, let's get into the omega the the omega three index. Okay, uh, this is really something so important, like the hemoglobin A one C that we use to measure people's blood sugar. But when we need to people need to know what their omega-3 levels are, and there's a lot of good reasons to it. But let's start off with, what is the omega-3 index? And my understanding, there are two labs, uh, omega quant and lipid lab, where you could get it measured. Is that correct? Um, no, omega quant okay. is correct. Okay. Uh, lipid lab offers, I mean, there are a variety of labs that offer different kinds of omega-3 based blood tests. Okay. Whether it's a plasma omega-3, well, whole, we, blood, whole blood. We, you, we'll get back into that. But what it, your first question is, what is it? Yes. Uh, the omega-3 index is a term that uh, my colleague uh, Clemens von Schacke and I, he, we kind of, re, in, if you call it invented, we developed or came up with this concept in 2004, uh, that red blood cell, the, you know, of course, red blood cell is the most common cell in the blood. It's the easiest cell to actually get a, a biopsy of, and it's, you don't have to get tissue. So we, we were very interested in the omega-3 content of the membrane of a cell, because that's where all the omega-3s really hang out in, in the body. They're parts of cell membranes. And so the red blood cell is kind of a model membrane, a model cell, it's a, the sentinel. We measure, we isolate the red blood cells, we measure the EPA and DHA content of that membrane. Some, the membrane's made up a, a lot of fatty acids. Phosph we call phospholipids, but the fatty acids are what's hooked to the phospholipids. So we measure the fatty acid content of the red cell membrane. We take the EPA and DHA portion of that, and we divide that by the total fatty acids. So it's what percent of the total fatty acids in the red cell is EPA and DHA. 
uh, to give people an idea of what's healthy, what's normal. What's normal is probably in America somewhere five to six from the studies we've seen. Uh, optimal is eight to 12. As I believe you mentioned, you're somewhere up in that area. Yeah, as am I'm I. around nine. nine yeah, nine. that's good. O over eight for sure. Um, and a, a really low, but like we, you mentioned uh, vegans earlier. Um, we, we, studies we've done in vegans, they're like three and a half percent. So we think under four is where you definitely don't want to be. Four to six, four to eight is kind of that intermediate zone. Six, five, five to six is average. Um, and again, over eight is where you want to be. We've seen studies we've done. Ninety-five percent of Americans are under eight uh, percent. So that's not a, a place to be. The way we do the blood test, uh, we can do it for some of our customers. We actually get a liquid tube of blood, spin it down, isolate the red blood cells, and take those red cells and analyze them directly in the lab. But for many of our customers, we do it with a dried blood spot. And so we can send you a kit where you just prick your finger, put one drop of blood on a filter paper card, put it in an envelope, mail it back. Um, within five days of receipt of the sample, we'll send you a report of what the your omega-3 index is, and we derive that from the dried blood spot. Um, and, yeah. So, and, and blood, just, just to make it, this is obvious, I guess, if you think about it, blood is really kind of 50-50 plasma and red cells. It's a mixture, and there's fatty acids, omega-3 fatty acids in the plasma, and there's omega-3 in the red cells. So when you do whole blood, you're getting an average of the two. Uh, and from that value, we're able to estimate what the omega-3 index is in red cells. Now, if you go to omegaquant.com, you could, you don't need a prescription. You could do it no. yourself and you, and you could, somebody at home could take the test. Is that correct? Exactly, exactly right. Excellent. Now, there are about, you mentioned the fatty acids, so there's about 64 fatty acids, and then you divide it by three, and that's how you get the number? Yeah, I mean, the, the typical slide I will put up at a, a presentation is a picture of a red blood cell, kind of a slice away from it, cut it away, and you look at it, and you see on the inside there's a membrane, there's, there's a, a, what we call a lipid bilayer in, in chemistry, the outer and inner layer of the membrane. And that's where the fatty acids are. And in the cartoon that I use, I have a, a drawing of a, a section of that membrane that's got 64 fatty acids in it. There's millions and millions of fatty acids in any given red cell, but just for teaching purposes. And I'll show 64, and then I think in my cartoon, I show four different fatty acids that are EPA and DHA out of the 64. And so if you divide 64, uh, 4 by 64, you get 6.25%. So that would be an omega-3 index of 6.25. So it's higher than the average American, but lower than optimal. And if you use plasma instead of red blood cells, there's more variability, about four times more variability. Is that correct? Yeah. You read my paper. Good for you. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I did read your paper. Yeah, we, we, we looked at uh, kind of the noise, the day-to-day, week-to-week. If you're not changing anything in your life, how much biological variability is there in the red cell EPA DHA and how much is there in the plasma EPA and DHA level? And we, yeah, we showed that it's like four times noisier, more variable uh, week to week if you're looking at plasma levels and you're going to red cell. And that's, that's back to your comment about hemoglobin A1C. It's the, kind of the averages out if you're looking at a red cell level. And that's that's what you want in a blood test. You want a doctor wants to know what's the person's normal normal levels of this molecule, whatever I'm looking at, glucose or omega three. So you don't want something that flip flops around depending on if you've taken a fish oil pill or eaten a salmon meal the night before. Like a high sensitivity C reactive protein, you could get like a ten times variability. Oh, so yeah. This right. is much that's, more, that's much more, much more secure. Now, the more uh, EPA DHA we have in the cell membrane, the more flexible the cell membrane is to allow nutrients in and waste out. Is that correct? I, yeah, and I, I'm honestly, I was just on a conference call this morning with a group in Germany. We're doing a study looking at the biology, the effects of omega three on the biology of red blood cell membranes, and uh, two very good groups uh, that do the measure. Very, uh, fluidity of membrane, flexibility of membranes. Um, 
and this this study we just you know we haven't published it yet, uh, but it, we we can't find any you know, looking very carefully. So far, we haven't seen a, a effect on membrane fluidity. That doesn't mean there's not an effect on membrane activity, and the actual uh, ability of a uh, proteins or receptors or channels that are going through the membrane to operate more effect effectively. Uh, we think that the latter is true. The omega-3s do change the way these proteins and receptors work, but it may not actually change the flexibility. And now, the study we did was all in normal, healthy, young people. Um, so maybe that's why we didn't see an effect. Um, it could be if you take 65-year-old you know, people with heart disease and, and diabetes, the omega-3s would affect the membrane fluidity. But it doesn't have to be an effect on fluidity per se to actually change cell function. Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromycel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromycel technology. Fitting multifocal contact lenses presents a big opportunity to meet patient needs while growing your practice. Alcon is your partner not only with our innovative portfolio, but through e-learning. Learn to enhance your multifocal strategy today with the Alcon Experience Academy. OIE Broadcasting is the emerging leader in social media. We use scientific entertainment to drive more patients into your office. Visit OIEbroadcasting.com and sign up today. Each generation was supposed to be healthier than the last one. Lifespan was supposed to be increasing. We were supposed to be in this paradise by now. Instead of getting healthier and healthier, it seems to have gone the opposite way. Millennials were projected to be the first generation in history to not outlive the generation before them. We are certainly headed for disaster. I think a lot of people are beginning to question the whole story. We live in a time where the paradigms are shifting. And the optometrist, in my opinion, is one of the best kept secrets. The public doesn't realize about going to the eye doctor. So many different diseases actually manifest in the eye. The back of the eye is the only place in the body that you could actually see the blood vessels. Completely non-invasively, you could screen thousands of people, not just for their eye health, but for their whole body health. Because this disease is here, it's also gonna be here. And I can look into the back of my eyeball, and there are expert doctors on the ground who are looking at my eyeball while I'm doing it. The eye is the canary of the mind. The eye is the kingdom. Will everyone please open their eyes? Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I bring extra and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you.